Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. Listen to the Word of the Lord. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Petu, Petu, Petuioli. There, we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted, me to, re wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain, these chains. They replied, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come here has reported or have said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect, sect of Judaism, which was turned into Christianity. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And what a powerful word it is. It kind of reads like a, a log book. And we've noticed that the last, last seven chapters as Paul has gone from Jerusalem now on his way to Rome. And Luke has joined him and Luke is telling us the events that happen and the miracles that take place. In fact, we have seen miracles and powers and signs. And we saw in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit empowered God's people to do what Jesus could do. Isn't that amazing? That is how we are to live. Jesus, when he gathered his disciples together and as he gathers us together, says, look, greater things will you do than I did because I go to the Father. Are you living in that life of victory? That's what Christ would want for you today. To know that you can do all things uh, and that God has empowered you to do so. Now, as we come to the book of Acts, I think it's important that we pause to understand how we've read the book. Because we've seen miracles. People, uh, Paul, who was bit by a viper and just shook it off. We've seen uh, people raised from the dead. We've seen people healed. And yet when we see that, we're tempted to think, oh yeah, that happened 2,000 years ago. But friends, in the mind of God, that just happened two days ago. And you're a part of the story, praxis, the acts of the Holy Spirit through God's church. That's you, still continuing on. But as we look at all of that and gather all that information, the question is, what do we do with that information? You know, sometimes we get interesting facts and we don't know what to do with it, but they're fun facts, aren't they? One of my favorite drinks is Snapple. Anybody ever drink Snapple? I brought my Snapple bottle here. I like Snapple. It's not my favorite drink, but it's pretty good. But what I like about Snapple is to pop the top, and right underneath there's a fun fact. <laughs> the problem is the more I drink Snapples, the more I have to keep pulling on. Like... <laughs> Did you know of the 190 
one members of the United Nations, Britain has invaded 171 of these. Wow. It's amazing. I have another one. You want another one? All right, good. I think people like... If there are two full moons in a month, the second one is called a blue moon. Very good. All right, good. A couple more Snapple fun facts, just because I think they're fun. Snapple says that chewing gum while peeling onions will keep you from crying when you're preparing your turkey dinner this week. Remember that. (laughs) The lifespan of a taste bud is about 10 days. Here's one more. Americans eat 18 acres of pizza every day. Isn't that a lot? I can go on and on. Uh, but, 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 you know, I'm very grateful for a Snapple education. <laughs> the problem is I've never learned how to take the Snapple bottles and the fun facts and insert them into a conversation. Hey, Daniel, guess what? Did you know of the... I mean, that's, that would be awkward, right? That'd be weird. Well, I figured out this morning how to do it because I just did it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, how do you fit facts, fit facts into your life? And as I was praying over the scripture this last week, I really felt it was important to be able to say, friends, we have to look at the facts we learn in the Bible and know how to apply them to our lives. Because if we don't, we just forget them. They don't mean anything. I've known many brilliant people who were top in their field in science or technology or history. And then later on in their life, they get Alzheimer's. They don't remember any of that. And you wonder, well, what happened to that information? Information by itself is nothing. And we have to ask the question whenever we read something, and so? And so what does this mean for my life, your life? Everything written in the Bible has a purpose to it. And yet there are so many people that read the Bible like a Snapple fun fact. Who can forget in the Bible, for instance, Balaam? who wanted to curse the Hebrews as they came into the land, and a donkey stopped, and the donkey talked to him, and he talked back. And you think, wow, that's kind of a weird fact, isn't it? One of the ones the middle schoolers like especially is King Eglon, the big obese king who, when he was stabbed by an assassin, the knife was sucked in his belly, and nobody could get it out. I know that's gross, but middle schoolers like that information. (laughs) The question is, what are you going to do with that? Or who could forget Samson when he wanted to get revenge on the Philistines? And so he captured 300 foxes, tiled, tied them in pairs, two by two, you know, of course that's what pairs, tied them in pairs, put a torch on them, and ran them through the field to destroy the crops of the Philistines. Now we look at the weird stuff that's found in the Bible, and sometimes we just laugh and move on our way, but there's a point to it all. There's a reason for everything we're told, everything that we're told. What do we do with it? I wanted to share this this morning because now we have finally, after months and months and months, looking through the facts of the book of Acts, friends, what are we going to do with it? And I hope it doesn't become a Snapple fun fact to you. Because what we learn in the book of Acts is this, God trusts you, God loves you so very much. Look at my beloved daughter, look at my beloved son. And Jesus, when he built this this thing called the church together, actually believed. Now go, love the world, serve, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. And if we look at the book of Acts as, well, that was a good study, and put it on the shelf, we're not treating it the way the Holy Spirit wants us to treat it. I hope when you leave today, you see that God loves you, God has called you, and you have a purpose in your life and you are to go and change this world. The same spirit that lived within Jesus, the Holy Spirit, now lives within you. Go and do great things. And so when we look at this, the book of Acts, we see that it ends abruptly. We just have Paul in Rome. We've journeyed with him throughout the book, and all of a sudden he spent two years getting from Jerusalem to Rome. Now you'll remember in those chapters before that seven chapters before this, Paul went to Jerusalem. He's told, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. But he went anyway. And there in Jerusalem, he began to preach to his people about this Jesus who died for people's sins and rose from the dead and how it lines up with the scriptures from the very beginning all the way through. Everybody was awaiting the Messiah. Paul is now proclaiming, this Jesus fits this and he rose from the dead. 
You'll remember Paul didn't believe in that until he had that moment of encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And now he boldly preaches that message and his fellow Jews want to kill him. And so he appeals to Caesar. Now he also has a Roman citizenship. And it, with a Roman citizenship, if you appeal to Caesar, you get a date to go to stand before Caesar. And Paul is rescued. And he's commissioned, if you remember in the story, with a, a, a great commander, a a centurion whose name is Julian. Julian's job, his one job is to get Paul from Jerusalem to Rome. And Paul is in chains now. And we've seen how that relationship has developed. In fact, we saw how Julian trusts Paul. He lets him go and says, go visit friends. Knowing that if Paul doesn't come back, he gets killed. But that was the kind of man Paul was. He was a man of integrity. His word was his bond. And now he's been in chains with Julian. Notice that Paul will be traveled with, with him will be Luke and Aristarchus. And we looked a few weeks ago that the only way they could have made this trip with Paul, the two-year journey, would be to become slaves to Julian, the centurion. But they love their friend. They show us what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. We have friends. We don't betray them. We stay with them. We die with them. That's the love the church is supposed to show to one another. In a world that hates one another and gossips and slanders and betrays one another, we who follow Jesus are supposed to show them, no, we don't do that to our friends. We don't slander gossip. We don't betray. We love one another. We encourage people and lift them up. It's countercultural. Counter Jesus taught us to love. How much? That he would stretch out his arms on the cross and die for us. And he would serve us. If you knew you were going to die in 24 hours, what would you do? I'll tell you what Jesus did. He washed the disciples' feet. He shows us how to live. We saw in this journey to Rome, now Paul is making the two-year journey. They don't know it's going to be two years, but they had a shipwreck. Two weeks ago, we talked about the ship being set out in late October, which they shouldn't have done, and Paul had warned them not to go on the sea in late October. They went, and the ship, sure enough, it was destroyed. 276 people on board survived the shipwreck. Paul was one of them. They landed in Malta. And there on the island, the uh, governor, Publius, treated all 276 with great hospitality and fed them and clothed them and warmed them. We even saw that Publius's father was sick of dysentery. And so Paul went and healed him. And before long, as he healed him, all the people who were sick on the island of Malta came to Paul and he healed them because he's a follower of Jesus. That's what we are to do. And then we find that after three months of being with Publius, when the time was right for them to sail again, Publius gives them all the passage stuff that they'll need to get from Malta to Rome. Julian, no doubt, would have hired the ship that we read about, the ship that was uh, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods, Cass uh, Paulus, uh, what were they? Castor and Pollux. And we find that Paul and, and um, Luke and Aristarchus and Julian on their way there, wherever they stopped, from Malta to Rome, the Christians, the followers of Jesus, came out and prayed for them and encouraged them. That is why it's so stunning when Paul gets to Rome. And the first thing he wants to do is talk to his Jewish friends, his brothers, and they say, we don't know anything about this. We haven't heard anything. And yet we find out those who follow Jesus, they knew about it. And then when he prayed, and I happen to believe that's the Spirit's way of saying, by following Jesus, you're awakened to things that are really happening. Sometimes religion can deaden us if it's meaningless. And so we find Paul being encouraged by the Christians along the way. And then in verse 14, we heard the words, we hear the words, and so we came to Rome. Wow. Two years. And so we came to Rome. I can only imagine as they walked into the city there with chains on and Julian, I can imagine Paul looking up. Now, Paul had been to Jerusalem, the hub of Jewish activity in the world. And Jerusalem was beautiful and glorious. But now they're in Rome, the hub of the world. And I can imagine their eyes wide open and their jaws dropping as they saw the, the, the buildings and the arenas and the statues 
This was truly the hub of the ancient world. And as they went in, I could imagine Paul's heartbeat to say, Oh Lord, help me preach about Jesus here. We learn that Paul would spend two years there waiting trial. And we don't know what happened, but we do know that he's dismissed, he's released. And we don't know if it is possible that the Roman authorities saw that, wow, this, this case when it gets to us is already four years old, forget about it. We don't know if that happened or if Paul stood before Caesar and pleaded his case and Caesar said, go free, this is not a charge. We don't know, but we know for two years in Rome he was chained to a soldier in an apartment. What we also know is that during the time of Paul in Rome, it was very fruitful. Four books of the New Testament are written during his time in Rome that, in that occasion. First time he went. Philippians, he writes to the church of Philippi. He writes to the church at Colossae, the Colossians. Philemon to a friend and Ephesians. In Paul's letter to the Philippian church, he writes in the first chapter that he desired their prayers because he's suffering. Here's what he says, and we can hear him in Rome waiting trial. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death, for me, for to me to live is Christ, and death is gain. Paul is awaiting trial. He has no idea what's going to happen. He's going to be released. He doesn't know it at the time he's writing it. But he writes in Philippians, I'm ready. I'm ready. Because for me, it's all about Jesus. That's it. It's about Jesus. And if I die, it's going to be gain. After he was released, about the year 62 AD, Paul went on his fifth and final missionary journey. He went to Crete, Macedonia, parts of Asia, and what is now confirmed and affirmed, he went to Spain. By 67 AD, Paul will be brought back to Rome for the last time. It's the time of Nero. I don't know about you, but Nero in history is one of the worst figures ever. He he would take those who follow Jesus. You might remember he burned Rome and he blamed the Christians, the followers of Crestus on this because in Rome, the followers of Jesus had grown and grown and grown. Historians, even Roman historians said those poor Christians had nothing to do with this and everybody knew Nero did it but he blamed them to put it on them. Nero would take the Christians, sick mind, we call him an antichrist in the Bible, not against Christ, but in place of Christ. That's what antichristos in Greek means. He'll take the Christians, he'll put them on poles and light them on fire as the lights for his garden parties. He will take the Christians and skin them alive and make chairs. Oh, I won't go on with this, but it's just sick and twisted and horrible. And we learn that as Paul, as he goes back in 67 AD, both he and Peter will die with the Christians. Peter will be crucified upside down. According to to, to tradition, he says, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. And they put him upside down on a cross and he dies. According to Eusebius, the church historian, Paul will be taken out along the Appian Way and there the soldiers will behead him. Paul says to his friend Timothy in 2 Timothy, right before this event, 2 Timothy 4, he says, this is the last time, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but to all who long for his appearance. Paul's talking about you and me. A crown. That's waiting. We've seen in the book of Acts that this crown that's given to us is not the diadem that a king wears. The crown is a winner's wreath. Stephanos. Because they cross the finish line. Then we see in Revelation that even those who cross the finish line with the winner's wreath, they take them off and they throw them back to God as if to say, oh God, you got us there. This is all about you. You gave us the strength. You made us finish well. I can imagine Paul as he crossed from this life to the next. He was immediately received into heaven. Well done, Paul. 
Thou good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your Lord. And Paul went to be with Jesus forever and heard the praise of all the angels and all the saints and all who ever lived. Well done, Paul. Well done. Because he would not give up on Jesus. And he shared Christ with the world. What kind of reception will you receive? What you do for the Lord is eternal. The things you do here on earth last forever. We put so much stock into the things of this world. We know people who want to make a name for themselves in this world. Fine. But that'll last only 80 years at the most. 100 years, 110 maybe now. What is done for Christ will last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Charles Thomas Studd, 1860 to 1931. He was a British missionary, a Christian writer, and a cricket player. You got to throw that in there. (laughs) The early part of the 20th century, he wrote these words that are so profound. Listen to them. This is a poem. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, t'was worth it all. Only one life, t'will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will laugh. There are so many more stanzas of this beautiful poem in which he makes the point, what we do here makes an eternal difference. And yet only what's done for Christ will last forever. Friends, I hope that's your focus in life. because we could live in the frenzy of this world trying to make names for ourselves and trying to make success and that's good and that's important but it's fading away what you do for Jesus will be remembered the point is well made it begins with the grace of God in our life the gift of God's son empowered by the spirit we can change the world and I want to say and and I want to encourage you as much as I encourage me Friends, live for Jesus Christ. It's going to make a difference. Not just one day, but now. Because as we live for Christ, we begin to experience Jesus walking alongside us and with us, who encourages us and loves us. And we hear his voice, and his voice, I think, is worth everything. Who says, I love you. You belong to me. Don't you listen to the world that tells you otherwise. When the world pulls us down and tells us, you're no good, who do you think you are? You're stupid. Jesus says, oh no, you're not. You belong to me and you're gonna rule and reign with me one day. Do not listen to those voices. What is the good news? John Stott in Christian Mission in the Modern World says these words. The good news is Jesus. And the good news about Jesus, which we announce, is that he died for our sins, raised from the dead. In consequence, he reigns as Lord and Savior in God's right hand and as the authority both to command repentance and faith and to bestow forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit on all those who repent, believe, and are baptized. And all this is according to the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. It is more than that. It is precisely what is meant by proclaiming the kingdom of God, For in fulfillment of Scripture, God's reign has broken into the life of men through the death and resurrection of Jesus. This reign or rule of God is exercised from the throne of Jesus who bestows salvation and requires obedience. These are the blessing and the demand of the kingdom. Jesus is Lord. Every generation has to answer who their Lord is. Every moment in your life is a... a, a, act of affirming Jesus as your Lord or denying him as Lord. Every generation has been called upon. Who is your Lord? And God bless those who would stand up and say, Jesus, because when I become, when I come to him, he sets me free. 
When I come to Him, He brings me joy. When I come to Him, I know what peace is like. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. And that's what it means. Jesus is Lord. The gospel is not just about being a nice person, though it involves that. The gospel is not about just being honest and fair in life, though it involves that. The gospel is not talking about the subject of love, though it involves it. It's about living out the love of Jesus Christ, not some nebulous term, because Jesus is love. It is about Jesus who loves you so much you have no idea. He wants to empower you to be more than a conqueror, to do all things. The Gospels, God's love. N.T. Wright declares, the Gospel is the royal announcement that the crucified and risen Jesus who died for our sins and rose again according to the Scriptures has been enthroned as the true Lord of the world. When the Gospel is preached, God calls people to salvation out of sheer grace, leaving them, leading them to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as the risen Lord. It is the proclamation that Jesus is King. Now here's where it gets really tricky. And where I go back to what I began at the begin, said at the beginning it's not enough to know about these declarations. It's not enough to know about Jesus. It's not enough knowing the facts of the Christian faith or even complex theology. That's not enough. Because knowing about those things will forget them. It is about living those things and receiving those things. It's about learning of Jesus, receiving him into your life, then living for him as a witness of the new kingdom. Friends, you don't belong to this earth. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. How is Jesus the Lord of your life? Do you live for him in every decision, every thought, every action you take? You see, the commission to preach Jesus is not just for Paul. He ran the race. He finished the course. He received a crown in heaven. The commission is for you and me. How do we live for him? Friends, one day you're going to cross from this life to the next, and I promise you, all the things you did for Christ will last. The angels and, and, and all those who lived, all of creation cried out, well done, Paul! And one day, all of creation will cry out and say, well done! Look what you did. And I long to hear the words of Jesus who says to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so when we look at the book of Acts and it ends, it doesn't end. Oh, it ends the way the Holy Spirit empowered Luke to write, but Paul's still waiting trial. And I believe the Holy Spirit did that on purpose because the book of Acts is still being written and one day you will read your story in it. And what will it say? I believe it'll say, well done. You shared about God's love. I want to end a story. I want to end the message with a story I once heard. It's about a man and woman who were so inspired one day to go to live their lives for Christ that they actually, in the 19th century, they actually, 19th, early 20th century, they actually went and gave up all and went to a third world country. And there in the third world country, they walked into a village and they began to educate the people and they fed the people and they provided healing and first aid to the people that were there because they needed it. They taught them about the Bible. They taught them stories of Jesus and they became poor and they suffered Decades later, they had to go back home, family and friends, and they boarded a boat, a long journey, and they went across the Atlantic Ocean. And as they came to New York, as they could see the, the, the difference of the city that was built as opposed to the village they had spent their life in, loving people and serving them for the name of Jesus. And as they stood there on deck one day, all of a sudden they saw into the harbor, they saw these banners, and they heard a band, and the banner said, Welcome home, Teddy Roosevelt. 
Teddy Roosevelt had been on vacation. He was the, he was the former president at that time. And, and as they stood there on board, they thought, oh my, we've been on board the boat with the president, or former president. And then the man thought to himself as they pulled up the harbor and they watched as Teddy Roosevelt down, walked down the gangplank. And he walked in. The, the band played, people cheered, the banners were raised, people shook his hand and patted him on the back and the man said, I get it. But he turned to his wife and he said, honey, we've just spent decades and there's no one here to meet us when we get home. Later that day, they arrived at their home and it was bothering the man and he said, honey, I get that, but nobody welcomed us when we came home. And his wife said to him, dear, why don't you go and have a little word with God in the other room? I think I will. He went in the other room, and a few minutes later, he came out with a big smile on his face. Did God speak to you? His wife asked. He sure did. What, what did God say? Well, I told God my disappointment that when we came home here in New York, nobody even said, welcome home. Why? And God said, I know you're frustrated, but son, you're not home yet. Just wait. Isn't that the point? One day, one day, friends, you will cross from this life to the next and only what you've done for Christ will be carried with you into eternity. But I promise you, actually I believe the scriptures promise you, if you live for Jesus Christ, you will hear Jesus say, well done. And you'll hear that applause and that cheer and the choirs and the praises and the banners saying, well done, not just for a moment, but forever and ever and ever and ever and ever because it's all about Jesus, isn't it? And as we leave this place today, I want you to go out with power and victory to live as though you belong to the kingdom of God, which you do. Not the kingdom of this world which is passing away. No more slander, no more gossip, no more pulling people down because the kingdom of God is about lifting people up and loving them and telling them that God loves them too. Amen? Let's pray. God, you love us so very much, more than we can ever imagine. And you smile upon us. When we feel discouraged in this life, it just means that we don't know how you view us. God, I pray as we leave the church today that we will be encouraged to live for you with all that we have to share the name that is above all names our Lord who reigns forever Jesus bless us to do that well I pray for anyone here today that might feel discouraged God that you lift them up and help them see the way you look at them that they're your son they're your daughter and they're so important Bless us as we leave to do your work well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 915 and 1115. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.